Okay, if I could encourage members who are leaving the chamber and indeed officials who are leaving the chamber to do so as quickly and as quietly as possible as we move on to the final item of business this evening, which is a member's business debate on motion 13416 in the name of Tim Eagle on resolving Scotland's rural depopulation crisis. Uh, the debate will be concluded without any questions being put, uh, but I invite members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Tim Eagle to open the debate around seven minutes. Mr Eagle. Uh, well, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to all the members who are here today and those that will speak on what I think is a pretty important debate. Uh, the slight problem, I have to be honest, I have with my own debate is where to start. Uh, rural depopulation might not sound like the most interesting of subjects, but to me it really, really is. And I'd like to tell you why, Presiding Officer, because Scotland is stunning. It is beautiful. In visit Scotland's visitor survey, Why People Choose Scotland, visitors said Scotland's iconic scenery and landscape and the richness of our history and culture remain as the top motivators for visiting. And if you don't want to listen to tourists, what about Robert Burns? My heart's in the Highlands. Wherever I wander, wherever I rove, the hills of the Highlands forever I love. The Highlands and Islands gives fresh air, breathtaking scenery, resilient, strong individuals with determination, courage and ambition. But I don't think it's over the top to say that it's dying. Here's just a handful of stats around the struggles of rural areas. GP surgeries in rural Scotland are closing at more than twice the rate of those in the Central Belt Health Boards. The top five health boards with the highest number of GP vacancies per 100,000 people are in the Highlands. No joke, Shetland, Orkney, Western Isles, Highland, Grampian, top the list, all of them in the north. Argyll and Butte Council were the first local authority in Scotland to declare a housing emergency in June 2023. Scotland's ferry network has collapsed. Services have been cancelled, islands have been left isolated, and promises to deliver new vessels on time and on budget have been repeatedly broken. The Ferries Community Board have warned that the lack of reliable ferry services is contributing to population decline on the islands. The delivery of essential broadband services through the R100, a critical cry from the people of rural Scotland, meant to be delivered in 2021, is behind. Scottish Government's own reporting on... Yes, sure. Finley Carson. Do you, do you agree with me that uh, having 3,500 homes in Dumfries and Galloway still to be connected up to R100 is absolutely despicable when these homes were supposed to be covered by the end of 2021? Yeah. Tim Eagle. I fully agree with the member because what they're crying out for is to be connected like everybody else so businesses can survive and thrive. And that's what we want to happen in rural Scotland. Scottish Government's own report on accessing childcare in rural and island settings highlights pressures for parents in Scotland's most remote areas. Parents are having problems affording childcare, accessing it when they need it, and finding resources for children under the age of three. An example, in Alapol in 2021, half the village's private childminders retired, and private and council-funded nurseries closed permanently during the pandemic. The Inverness and Cromarty Firth Green Freeport is expected to create around 10,000 jobs in the next decade and beyond. Great news, you would think. Something we can all get behind. Apart from the fact that Highland Council is forecasting a 23% fall in pupil numbers across its 29 secondary schools within the next 15 years. A 21% decline projected for schools in and around the Freeport area. And if you're interested, 24% decline in West Highlands and 27% decline in Sky. That's... Sure. Emma Roddick. Absolutely appreciate the, the points that he's making around housing availability. And, and I would point out that in Ullapool, of course, the average house price last recorded was over £310,000, largely because many of the houses available are being used as short-term lets. Now, does he also accept that the houses around the Inverness Freeport um, and the new people that that will bring in are not counted in those Highland Council figures for school rules? Tim Eagle, I can give you the time back. Uh, uh, thank you. I'll be honest, I don't know the specifics on that, but what I would say is, I'm going to come on to this later on, tourism is essential for the rural Scotland, so we've got to consider that when we consider collecting, and there is an issue with the delivery of housing within the SNP government at this point in time. Rurality, and rurality is known to be associated with a number of weaker outcomes, educational outcomes, from lower attainment through to lower social mobility, and there remains concerns that school pupils in remote parts of Scotland have lower levels of literacy and numeracy than those in accessible and urban areas. 
Presiding officer, I could go on. I've not even mentioned fishing, agriculture, tourism, or the big issue which we've just spoken about that is housing. What about migration and the future provision that will be required for adult health and social care from immigration? <laughs> The barriers, um, or the barriers for those in poverty accessing health care. Sorry, did I miss an intervention there, or somebody? <laughs> yep. Alistair Allen. Well, I was just curious that the member mentioned migration, given that his party has just abolished freedom of movement across Europe, which has been particularly keenly felt in fragile rural areas. Tim Eagle. I think, I, think the, I, think the, I, think, I think you maybe missed my point. I'm talking about internal migration, so the movement of people within Scotland. But that's fair enough. You can talk about that later on. None of this is to take away from those that are making it work, though, and I do give thanks to all of those in our rural areas, our teachers, our doctors, our nurses, our business leaders, etc., that are doing incredible work in rural Scotland. Surely, though, what we maybe all can agree on is that we want to see rural Scotland thrive. So let's move on to talk about action, presiding officer. Currently, the Scottish Government have published their action plan to address depopulation. The 88 actions of the action plan centres around three key chapters, community level, regional and local actors, and the national level at the national level. Importantly, the plan recognises depopulation as a priority area for the focus of the Scottish Government. Included in the list of actions is the establishment of an addressing depopulation fund. The fund will initially make available uh, £180,000 to be split between the prospective three local authorities over two financial years. £180,000 over two local authorities, that's 90000 a year, over three local authorities, sorry. Remember a few seconds ago I mentioned a ho I hoped all of us would get behind a thriving rural Scotland. You've got to ask yourself how £30,000 per authority is really going to make much of a difference. In fairness, though, in May, First Minister John Swinney announced £5 million for Scotland's islands communities during a visit to Shetland, and we do have the islands deal worth £100 million, £50 million each from the UK and Scottish Government over the next 10 years, helping drive sustainable and inclusive economic growth across Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles. Welcome measures indeed, but it's not enough. It's great we have a plan for funding economic pro projects, but yet as population decreases, so does funding through the COSLA funding formula to councils. So does the risk of closure of local public services such as hospitals, community hospitals and GP surgeries. Yes, sure. Brian Whittle. I'm very grateful for my colleague to get an intervention. When we're talking about migration, there is an inconvenient truth here that the SNP seem to avoid, which is this migration from rural to urban. And it's based on the fact in the last 17 years is the lack of investment in infrastructure. I wonder if that's something the member would agree with. Tim Eagle. Absolutely agree with that. And I'm just about to mention roads and infrastructure just now. Uh, uh, where was I? Uh, uh, so funding should clearly reflect the needs of servicing rural populations and not be based on population numbers themselves. Rural areas need a new funding formula, and that's really my call today, which recognises the increased cost of providing services over a much wider and difficult geographic area. It needs a new model for recruiting and retaining professionals into key roles. It needs an investment in roads. And it needs a government that will not just write delayed words, but will back it up with the finances which will allow it to become reality. So, presiding officer, and I'm just coming to the finish, I guess the question is this. If we can all accept that Scotland's rural landscapes are stunning, that those landscapes require local communities to nurture them and provide businesses for tourism, whisky and much, much more, and that we can all accept that even rural populations deserve access to essential services such as health, education, sports and roads, can we all agree to get behind a new funding mechanism that will, beyond specific deals, give local populations and their public services the chance to once again grow? And I wonder... Would the Minister commit to fighting for an increase in funding for rural Scotland in the budget this year and also give consideration, and also give consideration to ensuring all new policies are rural-proofed so that our communities can be assured that we are listening? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Eagle. As we move into the open debate, just a reminder to members uh, wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons, um, and if they've made an intervention, they may need to re-press their uh, request to speak buttons. I call first Emma Roddick to be followed by Jamie Hawker-Johnson. Around four minutes, Ms Roddick.
Thank you, President Officer, and thanks very much for the reminder about the buttons. Um, and my thanks as well to Tim Eagle, MSP, for raising this debate. I always welcome an opportunity to talk about population challenges and solutions. And I have to apologise for objecting to what I think is Tim Eagle's first member's business uh, speech. Um, it was just in response to suggesting that depopulation might not be the most interesting subject. It was my favourite subject as a minister, because when you talk about population, you can talk about absolutely anything. And I'll forgive him that transgression, because I do think he's right to put housing first on the list of uh, reasons for depopulation in his motion. Uh, while housing availability is not a driver in every single area facing depopulation, it is by far the issue that is raised most often with me when people say what is causing them difficulty in moving to or staying in an area of the Highlands and Islands. And it's absolutely key that we recognise the solution to that is not just about building new homes. It's about retaining the stock that we have and driving down the costs. Availability is a big part of that, but we cannot ignore that many towns and tourist hotspots across the Highlands and Islands can see over half of their residential houses being used as short-term lets. That prevents people from actually living in these buildings which were intended as homes. There was a very good P&J piece recently about the impact of Airbnb on housing prices. And we often hear about how few houses are available for private let in the Highlands and Islands and how long housing lists are for council and social landlord houses. But what you also need to look at when you consider those numbers is the Airbnb results pages for those areas. You will find a strong correlation and it is wrong to ignore it. I do also think that we need to talk ourselves up. I know that the tendency is to talk about how difficult things are, and they are difficult, and I don't deny that, nor the need for investment and action to change depopulation, but we're not going to attract people to move to or invest in the Highlands and Islands if all that they hear is that nobody wants to live there and services are struggling. Now, I'm proud to represent the Highlands and Islands and to live there. I have a strong affection for my local area, growing up in Rosher, supporting Inverness Cali Thistle, like my mum, even though they're putting me through the ringer right now, and having connections from Argyle to Shetland. People do want to live in the region that we represent, and there are highly skilled jobs available, good quality of life in many ways, and incredible potential in energy, space, innovation, and so much more. And I hope that people don't hear me saying this and think I'm trying to divert blame, because that's not the case. But I do want to make sure that people hear these places are good places to live and that the government hears that it's not just about areas suffering depopulation, needing investment and action to stay sustainable. It's that we deserve that. It is to the benefit of the whole country if we have vibrant, productive and active rural and island communities. Unsustainable increases in population are also difficult to manage in different ways for local authorities who have to deal with that. Inverness, Skye, Edinburgh struggle in this way. So a balanced population allows for economic activity across the board in tech, agriculture, fisheries and so much more. And I do want to point out that Mr Eagle's contribution did miss out some key investments from the Scottish Government, such as that at the port of Nig, near where I grew up, and, of course, the impact of that, which we know will be significant, not just for the area around the port, but the wider area that's been identified, that's going to be incredibly significant in terms of population movement, and it's not factored into school rules projections. School rule projections can change, and I sincerely hope that we see those changes as a direct result of the investment that is forthcoming from the Scottish Government. I do apologise, just finally, presiding officer, that given the interest, I'm not certain I can stay for the full debate, but I'm really glad that so many people want to come and talk and make contributions on such an interesting topic. Thank you. And I call Jamie Halker-Johnson to be followed by Rhoda Grant uh, around four minutes. Mr Halker-Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. Can I firstly thank my uh, friend and colleague Tim Eagle for bringing what I think is, I'm sure we will agree, an extremely important subject, particularly for those who live and represent uh, my Highlands and Islands region. Um, I've held a number of debates uh, in this parliament as, uh, in my time as an MSP. Uh, wood burning stoves most recently, which I know um, some people supported. The A9, the state of our roads, ambulances, ferries, apprenticeships. 
um, and they've all been very well attended. And the reason why I mention them is because they represent some of the infrastructure and the opportunities and the services uh, and the resilience that's absolutely vital if we want to have sustainable rural and island communities in Scotland. Now, I know that I've not got time to speak about all of them, but I'm just going to focus on some areas where I think uh, it's important to focus. And I'll start with health, because I think that's one that gets uh, a huge amount of attention, but is an issue that we are all very aware of, particularly those of us who live in rural Scotland. Um, in the last few months, I've raised the issue around Portree Hospital and the lack of urgent 24-7 care there, some of the incidents that have happened. We know, because it's, again it's been raised repeatedly, the pressures on uh, our maternity services right across the Highlands. Douglas Ross has raised Dr Gray's, uh, Edward Mount in Case Ness, and I've, and I've mentioned uh, the situation on Sky. And these are all real concerns. If you're a young family or if somebody wanting to start a young family uh, and you live in these areas, these are barriers to staying in those areas. As I was told recently on my visit to Sky by one former ambulance driver, he remembers a number of times hammering on really bad, often single-track roads at 90 miles an hour to get people from Sky to Inverness to give, give birth. Now, you know, that, that is a real concern if you're wanting to bring up a family. Tim Eagle mentioned the issue around rural GPs, underfunded and under great pressure. And only, I think, at the weekend it was announced that the, the last dentist, the last, last NHS dentist in Kyle, uh, was being lost, and that means that there won't be an NHS dentist for the whole of that, that area. That causes real issues, and if we're trying to encourage people either to stay in our rural communities or move to our rural communities, there has to be the health care and the other kinds of emergency care that they need, and there has to be the ability to start their family knowing that they'll be able to do that in a safe way. Housing has obviously already been mentioned, and housing and schools are two major issues that I think sit, uh, sit uh, often side by side. The Scottish Government has very belatedly um, declared a housing emergency, and, but we've known, those of us who live in the Highlands and Islands, it's been a real housing emergency for many, many years. And yet the Rural and Islands Housing Funds, two funds from the Scottish Government, were underspent. They were then extended. They were underspent again. And there didn't seem to be any real effort to actually change the criteria. So that money, that vital money that should have been being able to be used to provide homes for people in our communities, were being used. And on the school estate in the Highlands, it's the worst school estate in Scotland. Uh, so, and despite the fact that the, uh, some of the local councillors wanted to scare a, high, a Highland uh, a school estate emergency, that was blocked by the administration in Highland Council. A real putting your head in the sand for what was a real issue. And that's something that myself and other colleagues have seen when we visited schools across the Highlands. You know, we want people to be able to stay in communities and be educated, but they have to be confident that their children will be educated in safe schools and schools that actually enhance their learning. I could talk about lots of different areas, and I will briefly touch on, um, you know, we talk about North East, and North East being absolutely vital for jobs uh, for, oil and, uh, for oil and gas jobs, but the Highlands and Islands has a lot of high-paid oil and gas jobs too. Um, that's obviously something that uh, certainly some parties in this Parliament would threaten, but tourism is an industry that's really being hammered at the moment because of some of the, uh, the uh, rules and regulations that are coming from this chamber around short-term lets and DRS and just a lack of, uh, lack of real thought. And I could talk for, I'm, I, I do apologise, but I really haven't got time, <laughs> my, my apologies to Emma Roddick. I'm just going to touch very briefly on transport because that, as an islander, as the, as the very generous deputy presiding officer uh, also knows, we know that there's a real problem with ferries, we know there's a problem with things like the A9, and we've got to, if we, in conclusion, presiding officer, if we want people to stay in our rural communities, if we want them to bring their families up and grow their families, we have to make sure they have the services they need, the connect connectivity they need, the homes they need. That is not happening now. Thank you, Mr. Halko Johnson. I now call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Alistair Allen, uh, up to four minutes. Uh, Ms. Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I also want to thank Tim Eagle for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. Depopulation has long been recognised as a rural problem, yet we have seen very little progress to address it. The Scottish Government published an action plan to address depopulation earlier this year, but most of the actions in that plan were previous announcements and there was nothing new in it. And there was scope to take action uh, on a number of recommendations. Take, for example, STPR2 delivery plan and the Fair Fares review. But the Scottish Government have decided to explore, to further develop, to work with, engage and consider many things rather than actually doing anything practical. Presiding officer, the time for prevarication is long past. 
we know what is needed to address depopulation and we have to see delivery. Rural businesses are buoyant, yet, as the Fraser of Allender Institute report states, 28% of rural businesses report significant negative impacts due to the lack of housing. That's double that reported in urban areas. And yet the Scottish Government's rural building target includes areas that are commuter towns for our large cities. These areas will attract the housing investment, further drawing resources away from rural areas facing depopulation. How is the Scottish Government going to meet the housing needs of our rural areas? Areas distant from cities, areas where the cost of building a home is 10, sometimes hundreds of times more expensive than in urban areas. These rural areas have houses, but they are being bought up as second homes and holiday lets. Those types of um, housing are pricing out local people who are often low paid or working multiple jobs just simply to make one wage. What is government doing to ensure that people in those circumstances can compete, that they have access to the finance they need for mortgages to be able to access houses and indeed reasonably priced houses at that? What are we doing to retain housing stock for those who live and work in rural and island committees? And it's not, this is not just about those people themselves, it's also about services. If workers can't find a place to live, they can't take up a job opportunity, and that opportunity providing a public service. And we've heard already about Portree Hospital, which is often closed due to the lack of staff. And according to NHS Highland, that is duly lar uh, largely due to the lack of housing, because people take up those job opportunities, but then have to pull out because they can't find somewhere to live. I, if I a very short interview. Briefly, Rachel Hamilton. Could Rhoda Grant confirm that Kate Forbes said today at the Scottish Fishermen's Federation that the lack of housing, rural housing, is, is a factor in causing depopulation? Rhoda Grant. Yes, and I think that's widely understood by everybody, and therefore we need action on affordable housing in rural areas. Because when you look at affordable housing, 25% of the people in Scotland live in affordable rented housing. But if you take the figure in rural Scotland, that falls to only 15%. So that difference highlights the lack of availability of affordable rented housing in rural areas. Therefore, rural dwellers are more likely to have to buy or privately rent accommodation. And because of that, they're much more likely to be impacted by the second home market. Add to that that poverty is higher in rural areas. The reason for fuel poverty are well understood, but not so much the higher cost of living. This was 15 to 30 per cent higher in rural and island communities before the cost of living crisis. And we're getting to the point that rural Scotland will simply be a playground for the rich and deserted by ordinary people who'd wish to make their home there and to raise their family but can't afford to do so. The cost of goods are higher, public transport is non-existent, meaning that people are forced to run a car, and these cars have to be low cost, meaning they're older and less efficient to run, adding to the higher cost of living. And this is a point made by the Poverty Alliance in their briefing for this debate, because the high poverty is driven by high transport and energy costs in rural areas. What rural areas need are homes, infrastructure and access to services. And I would urge the Scottish Act and Government to act to provide that. Thank you, Ms Grant. I now call Alistair Allen to be followed by Ari Amber, just uh, up to four minutes. Dr Allen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I firstly thank uh, Tim Eagle for securing uh, this debate on a very important issue, the future of our rural and island communities. My constituency famously includes the island of Hurst or St Kilda, Next year marks the 90th anniversary of the evacuation of the last of that island's population. And St Kilda's story has, of course, become sadly iconic, but it was far from the most recent island in my uh, constituency to be abandoned. Tarancy, Heishker and Scarp all sprang to mind. All of these examples make uh, only too clear what depopulation ultimately can mean and what happens if we do not meet the needs uh, of rural and island communities today. 
Of course, Scotland's Parliament and Government have long been active in seeking to tackle these issues, and as others have mentioned, in February this year the Scottish Government did publish its action plan to address depopulation, setting out its priorities to reverse depopulation in Scotland. Now, like others, I could talk for a long time and won't today about the policies that uh, it takes to tackle depopulation. If it's very brief, yeah. Rachel Hamilton. Does Alistair Allen worry that the action plan is not based on a statutory footing? Alistair Allen. Well, I, I, I suspect that if it were, um, the member would, uh, would complain that we were wasting time legislating rather than providing policies. But I, I, I think, it, as I say, there are, there are many areas that need to be tackled uh, in terms of policy and are being tackled. Uh, and of course, there are many I could go through, but one of, I would want to touch on is uh, many people have mentioned housing. Uh, and in addition to the money that's going into social housing, I think, as Rhoda Grant and others have pointed out, we do also have to confront the reality uh, that there are some parts of the country where the housing market operating as it presently does is not operating in the interests uh, of rural communities. And to pick up on a, a defensive point that I think was made by the Tory benches about this, I have to be clear that some of the people who complain to me about the situation with um, uh, housing being unavailable for, for for, afford, for, for people to buy locally because of the, the tourist market are actually tourist industries who cannot find a workforce because there is no one, nowhere for people to live to work in their industry. Now, of course, there are other things we could say about infrastructure already mentioned in this debate. Um, and uh, it, we, could, we could certainly talk about um, broadbands, as, as others have, have done. Um, and I, I would certainly accept that we need to, uh, uh, we need to roll out further uh, digital connectivity for many communities uh, in rural constituencies to ensure that they are places that can flourish in the future. Fast broadband speeds will certainly uh, ensure that when they come. And it is, however, worth putting on record, given from what we heard from the Tories today, that despite broadband being fully reserved to the UK government, the vast share of the cost of new digital infrastructure, for example, via the R100 programme, has been borne, I'll bring in in a minute, by the Scottish Government, and Scotland's rural communities simply were not a priority for either BT or the UK Government, and so the Scottish Government stepped in, and I'll allow the member Briefly, to step in. Briefly, Finlay Carson. I, I really appreciate you, you let me in on this. Does the member not appreciate that R100 was a Scottish Government project that fell far short of what was required and years behind schedule, and that the, the physical rollout of broadband is, a, is, is a devolved to the Scottish Government? Yeah. Alistair Allen. Well, we can argue all day about either broadband is reserved or it's not, and the, broad and the Scotland Act 1998 says it is. But the more important point, presiding officer, is that uh, we have to support our uh, rural communities in many ways. And I would just conclude by saying that the language we use to describe our rural communities is also important. They are not remote, for starters, although worse descriptions have been used in recent months by certain individuals. We have seen the former Tory deputy chairman describe my own constituency as a place where, quote, nobody lives suggesting that it should be used as a sort of surrogate Rwanda for asylum seekers. And meanwhile, a Labour parliamentary candidate has inferred on television that Northern Scotland's apparent remoteness made it an ideal location to berth accommodation barges packed with smuggler gangs. So, presiding officer, I'm confident that this parliament's commitment to tackling depopulation in our rural areas uh, is something that it will take forward to the future. We need debates such as this to renew our focus on the priorities we should have now for rural Scotland, as well as the ambitions we should have for rural Scotland when they have the full powers as a, a normal independent country at their disposal. Thank you. I now call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Eleanor Whittam around four minutes. Ms Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I firstly thank Tim Eagle for this important debate. As we've heard, the depopulation of rural and island communities is one of the most pressing challenges facing our nation, often closely intertwined with deep-rooted issues of rural poverty. Now, if left unaddressed, it risks permanently altering the fabric of Scottish society and depriving us of the rich cultural heritage embodied in our rural areas. There is a tremendous opportunity that could be brought to the Highlands and Islands through the actions needed to address the climate and nature emergencies. At a recent rural policy CPG, Matthew Club from Nesfit pointed out that we have the potential for 500,000 jobs retrofitting housing across Scotland so that we meet our 2045 climate target. That's good green jobs in just one sector, 
but our rural economies can be transformed through work in nature restoration, renewable energy, culture, community and care. Presiding officer, we cannot allow the same corporate capture of the renewable revolution that has, has blighted fossil fuel development for decades. Community ownership puts people, not private profit, at the heart of our energy transformation. With a stake and a share in renewable projects, communities can reinvest in locally determined priorities like affordable housing, community facilities or environmental initiatives. And what stands in the way, as we've heard this evening already, is housing. And that's why I led the debate on rural housing and why I've been working on solutions with communities, local authorities and the Scottish Government to address the need for a range of housing to grow our rural and island populations. What I've, presiding officer, what I've heard from rural and island communities is that they are often challenged internally with conflict. And that's why I've been raising with the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Islands the need to fund skilled community organisers and development workers to address the challenges they face in the way that suits them. We've seen a superb example of this work with the Association of Deer Management Groups and Environmental Conservation Organisations, where uh, the Centre for Good Relations facilitated a process of greater understanding. And the carbon neutral islands and regional land use partnerships are fantastic testing grounds for a new and supported approach to community engagement and empowerment. We must take seriously the call for greater democracy and consider more ways for people to engage more fully with the policy design that will impact their lives. And the best way to do that is to devolve decision making and fiscal powers to the most local sphere where people decide what matters to them on the doorstep. And I found it interesting that Tim Eagle said his thrust of this evening's debate was around calling for a new fiscal formula. The uh, cost of living in rural Scotland is significantly higher than in urban areas. The phenomenon known as the rural premium, geographical barriers necessitate travelling further for essential services, goods cost more, and I, sorry, I don't have time, and harsher climates driving up heating costs. Any strategy to rejuvenate rural Scotland must confront this interlocked web of rural poverty drivers head on. Innovative pro pro approaches like piloting a minimum income guarantee in rural areas may be part of the solution. Young people are a vital asset in rural areas. Ensuring they remain or return requires innovative approaches to providing opportunities for empowerment, education and employment. But it requires listening to their priorities and concerns. And earlier this year, the Scottish Rural and Islands Youth Partner Parliament convened where young people articulated their vision for the future of their communities. These young people recognise that tackling depopulation requires holistic, economic, social and environmental solutions. And we must heed their calls and work tirelessly to create vibrant rural communities, opportunity-rich places where young people can thrive. When young people and communities see their priorities embraced as an impetus, for change and feel their voices have authentically shaped decisions impacting their futures, rural living will become an inspirational and magnetic prospect, not a fading dream. Thank you very much. I now call Eleanor Whittam to be followed by Rachel Hamilton around four minutes. Ms Whittam. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I start off by thanking Tim Eagle for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. Those of us who represent rural areas are acutely aware of depopulation and its consequences to our communities. And since I was elected to represent Carrot Cumnock and Dune Valley, I've seen the impact depopulation has had, especially across our former coal fields. There has been a brilliant oral history project on the go, supported by the Coalfields Community Landscape Partnership and Strathclyde University, to document life in Ayrshire's lost villages. And I've been fascinated to hear of the bustling communities built up around the pits, such as Lethen Hill and Trebech, places where miners and their families toiled to power the Industrial Revolution, but were beholden to their employers for the miners' raw cottages that were tied to their employment. Now, some of these settlements were only a few rows, and others became villages complete with community halls and reading rooms constructed via funds raised by villagers themselves. And one place even became the place of footballing legend. 
There's, a, there's very little left of Glen Buck today, but that small village of 1,700 folk who lived without electricity and indoor plumbing was the birthplace of the Glen Buck Cherry Peckers Football Club and was home to pioneers of the game, producing 50 professional footballers, six Scottish internationals, four FA Cup winners, and most famously, Liverpool's, Liverpool manager, Bill Shankly. I urge anyone who's a Shankly fan to visit the memorial at Glen Buck and take a moment to look around and contemplate what was lost along with the buildings and the pet closures. When I was COSLA's spokesperson for community wellbeing with responsibility for migration, I worked across parties and local authority areas when we convened a working group looking at the significant demographic and depopulation patterns across the west of Scotland. We recognised then that there had to be concerted effort across all spheres of government, UK, Scottish and local, to look at the drivers of depopulation and the consequences of this coupled with an ageing population. It was fully recognised that communities must be supported and empowered to help drive regeneration. It was apparent that depopulation quickly becomes an unstoppable force that could see a community shrink, shrink rapidly without concrete interventions created to stop the exodus of young people towards more urban settings and then not having them venture back once they're starting families of their own. Now, I immigrated to Canada age six, but my family are very unusual in that we all came back. Connectivity, opportunity and amenity are the keys for areas at risk in my constituency. Access to employment opportunities, health and social care services and leisure are all key. Housing pressures are very different in places such as Newcomnock, as we had a mass exodus when the last of the pits closed, meaning that there was an oversupply of social housing. But creative thinking was needed to try and consolidate the future of the town, where derelict properties were demolished and new amenity properties were built closer to the town's core centre. Central to all of this was activity, um, to this activity was the coming together of the community to create the Newcomnock Development Trust, who spearheaded community empowerment via the creation of a community-led action plan, which ultimately led to a town master plan for regeneration. Recently, they have secured £1.8 million from the Scottish Government RCGF funding round and also £165,000 from the levelling up funds towards their goals. The Trust also supports the community with access to leisure activities, dignified food provision, youth activities and social enterprise. The area has seen a prolifer proliferation of renewable energy and the nine community councils representing the areas most impacted, including Newcomnock, have come together to create the 9CC group. That's not a 10CC tribute band, but the 9CC group, helping to manage and distribute community benefit allocations from new and future wind farm developments. They aim to strengthen their community councils to increase participation, active citizenship and cross-membership with other groups. They believe that communities should have full control over the disbursement of community benefits and recognise that to deliver long-term regeneration, it is imperative that the disbursement of these community benefits monies are pooled and coordinated to deliver long-term legacy benefits and, recent, and, and regeneration. And recently, an initiative between the 9CC group, East Ayrshire Local Employability Partnership and Local Employer Emergency one has provided more than £1.5 million of funding over four years for 20 trade apprentices, giving local young people brilliant opportunities. I believe what is happening in Newcomic is ground up generation, regeneration of a rural community supported at all levels of government, and I am sure it has been replicated in other areas across the country, but we need to ensure we provide the means by which other areas are able to forge a path for the thriving, thriving future of their own communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Whittam. Um, before calling the next speaker, I am conscious there are a number of speakers still wanting to participate in the debate, and on that basis I am minded to uh, accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 uh, to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes, and I invite Tim Eagle to move such a motion. Uh, moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Thank you very much. I, I therefore call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Emma Harper in four minutes. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I first uh, thank my colleague Tim Eagle for bringing forward this very important debate on the depopulation crisis facing rural communities. If I may, Presiding Officer, I would like to start by sharing a challenge faced by a community in my constituency which chimes with what Tim Eagle said earlier. And among, amongst the um, SNP cuts to local authority budgets, the um, local authority has taken a very tough decision to make the nursery in West Rother inactive. 
um, they have cited low enrolment and pressures on their resource allocations. And I recently met with several local parents who shared the impact this would have on their daily lives. And many were worried that this would leave them with no access whatsoever to childcare options as the next closest nurse nursery is 20 minutes away with no direct bus connections going from the village. Um, and despite the construction of new housing, which won't be completed until 2025, the closure of the Early Learning Centre is another barrier that makes it harder to keep and attract families to the village. Our campaign, although it may seem small, has reached a very large number and larger than the village of Westruther. It's reached 130 signatures so far, which demonstrates the anger and frustration of the residents about the impact that cutting key local services like this will have on the future of their communities. This is just one example of the challenges facing residents who want to make rural communities their home. I spoke to one woman who said that they'd moved for uh, the way of life in, in the countryside from Edinburgh, but now she's faced with these unbelievable challenges that she never thought that she would have faced by moving to a rural community. And constituents write to me on a daily basis about other barriers that they face. Recent examples have included concerns about the future of community hospitals in the borders and the removal of a key bus service route through St Boswell's. Unfortunately, every ba barrier such as these makes it harder to keep and attract people in rural communities. But depopulation isn't caused by one issue alone and it won't be resolved by one action alone. Rural depopulation needs to be tackled in the round. It's about creating an environment in which young people and families have the access to the services they deserve. It's about ensuring that public transport in rural areas is accessible. It's about providing reliable digital connectivity. It's about ensuring that rural schools are well resourced. It's about creating employability opportunities for young people so that they are given every opportunity to stay. And crucially, it's about ensuring that there are enough homes for people who want to make rural communities where they live. Sadly, a loud and clear message is being sent from a central belt focused government to people in these communities as key issues like these continue to go unaddressed. For example, all the MSPs that voted to close 50% of Scottish seas to our fishermen and impact on their jobs, their livelihoods, and described as catastrophic by the Scottish Fishermen's Federation. I'd like to briefly highlight why it is important that we tackle rural depopulation. Rural communities sit at the heart of Scotland's culture and traditions. And last week, I had the honour of celebrating Hoyt Common Riding. And later this week, Alistair Allen, MSP, will be delighted to know that I'll attend Selkirk's Common Riding. These events are a fantastic display of our history and culture and show the pride borderers have in their communities. But it is, unfortunately, traditions like these that will die out if people continue to be pushed away from our rural towns and villages. To conclude, presiding officer, the SNP have presided over this decline in our rural communities. And at every turn, they are hindering families and young people who want to choose rural. So far, this piecemeal policy approach and inadequate funding have done little to address the alarming situation that rural communities are facing. More needs to be done, and I look forward to hearing from the Minister. Thank you. I now call Emma Harper to be followed by Finlay Carson. Uh, around four minutes, Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak on this important date, and I congratulate Tim Eagle on securing it. Many members have well outlined the challenges created by rural depopulation, and both in Fries and Galloway and the Scottish borders in my South, Scottish, South Scotland region are no exception. I will therefore focus my brief remarks on these areas and on some of the actions constituents tell me must be taken if we are to support our rural communities to have a thriving future. 
presiding officer, fallen populations, a lack of affordable housing and high fuel costs are among challenges facing DNG and the borders. And researchers at the Scottish Rural College have de de detailed the problems in a new study released just at the latter part of last year. Transport poverty was identified as an issue, with people depending on their own vehicles due to the absence of affordable alternatives. The study, which was carried out as part of a wider work for the Scottish Government, found increased costs of homes and fuel across, in particular, Dumfries and Galloway. Researchers said that there had been a clear trend of significant house prices inflation from 2004 to 2021, and the average property prices had increased by as much as 102 per cent compared to 71 per cent in urban areas. Indeed, the study also suggested high proportions of second and vacant homes as a persistent challenge in remote mainland locations. This is a particular challenge which I hear from constituents daily. Places in DNG like coastal Rockcliffe and Nile Whithorn have many registered second homes, and this is stopping local people from being able to purchase or even rent property, and it's con contributing to the decline of local amenities like shops, GP practices and local schools. In some of these locations, more than a third of the housing stock was taken up by second homes. And when, while I understand the government has taken action on these second homes, I would ask the Minister to ensure that local authorities are taking steps available to them to address this issue. Presiding officer, one of the areas which continues to be brought up to help address rural depopulation and to recruit people to sectors like the NHS is local amenities and the availability. Dr Stephen McCabe, the clinical director of primary care in NHS Highlands, recently wrote an interesting blog which su with suggestions on how to address the rural population or rural depopulation challenges. He was specifically um, addressing rural depopulation for general practice, which is actually a global issue. And just doing a quick search, as everybody's starting to speak today, across the world, rural areas are going through demographic um, transition right now, and declining population is witnessed across the globe. Japan has many islands like Scotland does, and it's experiencing depopulation on their islands. And the ODI, which is a think tank, they've published online reports and briefing papers regarding what population decline and what to do about it. So it isn't just a Scottish issue. There are so many reasons why it's happening and this is something that uh, I think we can learn from as well. I, I really don't have time, Mr Carson. I'm sorry. I know you're up next on your feet, though. Um, Dr McCabe said that one of the, the issues that we need to think about is amenity and this is what other people have spoke about already. So good, good broadband, faster reliable transport, affordable housing, easy access to a wide variety of activities both for themselves and their children. And people are also looking for a work-life balance so that they can um, maybe work in a more manageable way and even not as many hours. So finally there's shops and cafes and places to hang out. So one of the things that Dr McCabe says that unless we do um, and provide similar levels of amenity in our rural areas will struggle to fill our health care vacancies. So I would ask the Minister to reflect on these suggestions and look to work with other Ministers to ensure that, for example, our planning system works to this aim. In closing, presiding officer, I welcome the debate. I know there's been a lot of interest in it, but I'd be keen to make sure that Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish Borders receive equal attention when addressing rural depopulation. Thank you, Ms Harper. And I call the final speaker in the open debate, Finlay Carson, around four minutes, please, Mr Carson. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to Tim Eagles for bringing this important uh, debate to the Chamber. He's spot on. It can be an idyllic way of life, living in a picture postcard town or village, surrounded by glorious countryside and wildlife, particularly in Scotland's most beautiful constituency of Galloway and West Dumfries, <laughs> Bonnie Galloway. So it's little wonder that many dreams of this tranquility, the slow pace, while enjoying the strong community spirit. But the stark reality is, despite that strong spirit and beautiful surroundings, we have communities dying across rural Scotland because of this SNP government's failure to understand rural Scotland. Their mismanagement of rural policy is leading to falling populations, a serious lack of affordable housing, poor public transport, high fuel costs and now school closures. These are just some of the reasons why the younger generation, who should in fact be the future of these communities, are moving away when they get the chance. 
The Scottish Government have known about this decline for years and simply sat on their hands, only recently announcing a plan to help communities uh, facing population decline. Why so long? They have been in power for 17 woeful years. The south west of Scotland was once referred to as the forgotten corner, and this was the question I was going to ask Emma Harper, but now the widely held uh, view is that it is not the forgotten corner, but it's, after 17 years it's turned into the ignored corner. Mm. A succession of First Ministers, including the current First Minister John Swinney, have all promised major investment in transport infrastructure and improvements to Stranraer Town Centre. But time after time, the Scottish Government has failed miserably to deliver. For proof of its utter negligence, you only need to look back at the last budget, with Shona Robinson announcing a series of budget cuts to the south of Scotland enterprise, to agriculture, to forestry, as well as marine and new affordable housing funding. Does this SNP government recognise rural Scotland at all? Because people who are struggling right now to live and remain in rural areas are having serious doubts about that. Unless you live in the central belt, you are an afterthought when it comes to the Scottish government. How on earth? Are cash-strapped South Scot Enterprise going to be able to support policies to attract and retain good jobs and future opportunities for young people? Economic development is critical to rural... Uh, Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving me... Forgive me, Presiding Officer, I'm too keen. Um, I, I understand why the, the member w wants to make points about the problems of living in, in rural Scotland. I can understand many of them, but can he just reassure me as, as, as somebody who represents the Western Isles that he is not going to just continually lazily try to claim that the party of government are a central belt party when the first minister and the deputy first minister represent rural and island constituencies. Finlay Carson, I give you the time back. So is another intervention from Ms Harper? Emma Harper. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate that. Half the ministerial team are for rural constituencies, so you can't just constantly go on about SNP being central belt. It's, it's not the case. Finlay Carson. I, I think that says it all. Whilst we have half the government are from these constituencies, they're still failing. And that's the view, not just of us on these benches, it's the view of rural communities right across, uh, across Scotland, and particularly, particularly in the south of Scotland. Yep. But we've had budgets uh, of the enterprise company cut, um, you know, and uh, housing budgets slashed, with no new homes being built or to the extent that we should. Then why are not housing targets based on the needs of rural communities rather than the arbitrary percentage of the wholly inadequate national targets? Mm -hmm. The same applies when it comes to health care services, with patients in my constituency having to unnecessarily travel miles and miles for appointments and minor treatments for straightforward procedures. These services could be delivered at the four mothballed cottage hospitals if only there was a clear plan. People want and demand health and maternity services closer to home, and rightly so. So I believe it is time for an urgent review of the NRAC formula to ensure that sufficient funding is given to rural areas to ensure equality in terms of access to health and social services. President, also we have a, pl a public transport service that is dwindling away or being dramatically reduced, while the Scottish Government bleats on about free bus travel for under-22s. The young people in my area are asking the question, what is a bus? In contrast, thanks to the UK Government, things are moving forward with A75, with specialists being appointed to start work on the design of the bypasses around Springholm and Crockett Ford, undoubtedly providing a significant boost to the local economy, given the £9 billion worth of goods that travel along it yearly. Presiding officer, I agree with the Scottish Land and Estate briefing. We need a government who will adequately consider and take measures to understand rural communities or rural depopulation will continue at a worrying rate. Central Belt policymakers need to understand rural Scotland. The Minister, I hope, should give my constituents and other rural communities a commitment to a rural proofing policy to re reverse depopulation. Thank you. And I now call on Cocab Stewart uh, to respond to the debate. Minister, around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, um, and I'm uh, delighted to see that there was so much interest in this debate, and members across the Chamber have uh, raised many challenges and talked about the complexities, uh, but 
also uh, celebrated uh, the opportunities that do exist and the wonderful nature of uh, our rural communities as well. Um, I acknowledge and thank Tim Eagle for raising this important issue and I know that he's taken an extensive interest in this by asking several questions on this matter uh, over his time. Uh, we all realise and have mentioned that these are complex and multifaceted challenges with clear links to many areas of government delivery but ones which myself and my colleagues on the Ministerial Population Population Task Force are committed to responding to. Um, the Rural Lens Toolkit uh, will provide a systematic approach uh, to look at the opportunities and challenges of rural communities and that will be used to be considered across all Scottish Government portfolios because the responsibility to address these issues lies across the portfolios. Yes, I will. Jimmy Hulker Johnson. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking intervention. Um, 17 years the Scottish Government have been in power. Does it really take a toolkit to tell, tell us what island communities and rural communities know that services like health, like ferries, other transport links, like some of our schools, etc., uh, need action? They needed action for a long time. It doesn't need a toolkit to tell us that. Minister, I can give you the time back. Uh, thank you to Mr Johnson for making those points. Um, as I have said, they are very complex um, and the Scottish Government is continued to addressing those issues. The sustainability of rural and island communities is vitally important and of course we want to see a Scotland in which everyone can play their full part with empowered communities shaping their individual and collective futures and many members have referred already to the published and we are implementing our first action plan to address depopulation which aligns with our wider approach to supporting rural and island Scotland including the National Islands Plan. We recognise that Scotland is not alone in facing these demographic challenges and we can learn from other countries. Our population strategy was in fact the first of its type in the UK which was published in 2021 and it set out our commitment to engage as an outward looking nation with other European nations to share learning and best practice on demographic policy approaches and presiding officer later on this evening uh, after this debate I'll be uh, attending a welcome reception at the European Population Conference which is taking place in Edinburgh this weekend to share the expertise around demographics, migration, depopulation and more. And for us in Scotland, harnessing the inputs of experts from our expert advisory group on migration and population is key to ensuring we develop the most robust policy responses that we can. Um, from this group, we do have clear evidence that expert and expert analysis that Scotland does face a distinct demographic challenge in part because of the historical legacy of out-migration, which particularly impacts our rural and island communities. And we know that the current immigration system, which is reserved to the UK government, is not effective in dealing with the challenges that we face in Scotland. The, I'm going to crack on. The Parliament sent a concrete message in 2022 of the urgent need for practical, workable migration solutions which would deliver for Scotland's communities in the form of a rural visa pilot proposal. Now, sadly, the current UK government rejected this proposal, despite its own advisers, uh, independent advisers, saying that the pro proposal is a sensible and clear in both scale and deliverability and stated that it is in the UK government's interest to trial the scheme. This is uh, also despite the fact that without inward migration Scotland's population would already be falling, made, which is already falling, would be made worse by the effects of a hard Brexit and the ending of freedom of movement. Uh, I see Jamie Halkrow. Jimmy uh, Johnson. Johnson. Um, th thanks very much. I was just going to make the point I think that the Minister was kind of touching on there. We have actually large amounts of um, migration into the UK, but Scotland isn't attracting migrants to come here. And one of the other issues, and I think it's been raised by a number of people today, is 
even if we were encouraging people, there isn't the accommodation. The homes haven't been built in our rural communities. And that's a devolved issue, and that's something the Scottish Government have failed on. And if you disagree with that, why have we got a housing emergency? Minister, I can give you the time back. Uh, thank you. I will be coming on to housing um, on that. Uh, Rhoda Grant, do I have time, presiding officer? I can give you additional time, Minister. Uh, Rhoda, Rhoda Grant. I was going to make similar points that we can encourage inward migration, but the very issues that are forcing our young people out of rural communities mean that we can't house new people in our rural communities. Minister. And the member makes a valid point, and I'll try and address it in the time that um, I have. Uh, so uh, you were referring to the powers that we do have, um, and this Scottish Government is committed to addressing the challenges of depopulation through collaborative working with partners, and be that academic, international, regional, local or community base to deliver innovative and sustainable solutions. So the publication of the Addressing Population Action Plan, um, ADAP, uh, I may refer to in short, represents the meeting of a key commitment of the Population Task Force um, and it harnesses a broad evidence base and builds on deep engagement with partners uh, to establish a strategic delivery focused approach. Now, it recognises that there are no quick fixes to depopulation within affected communities, but it does seek to ma maximise the tools we have at our disposal. Now, I see that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try and address to, uh, some of the points that have been raised. With regarding to the depopulation funding that was raised by Tim Eagle, uh, we are committed to working with COSLA to deliver solutions in a sustainable way, but we also know that smaller targeted funding can have an outsized effect. So I think listening to the communities is important. And I also restate that this is the first phase of the work on the pathfinders, and we can learn from that. So certainly, you know, my ears are open. And as we take the lessons, I am open to looking at uh, solutions going forward from that. Um, Rhoda Grant mentioned about housing. The, uh, I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to carry on. The action plan um, with regards to the Rural and Islands Housing Action Plan makes commitments on affordable homes, and other members have mentioned uh, regarding second homes that can benefit but are also a challenge. So um, I will remind you of uh, the legislation, uh, the power that we gave to local authorities to charge up to 100% premium on second homes. That is now in place and local authorities can use that power from the 1st of April 2024. Um, regarding schools, there were a few members that mentioned that. The commitments on the two billion learning estate investment programme um, uh, is there, and members can look into that for further information. I'm speeding through because of time. Um, I think, presiding officer, I may be testing your patience as long as I can. Uh, just to sum up, uh, members have raised uh, very seriously uh, the issues, and I want them to know uh, that this government does take its responsibilities very seriously within the scope of devolved matters, and it is working with the action plan to enforce that and proceed with it and accelerate it as much as possible. And my door is open. Uh, there will be points I haven't had a chance to address. I would encourage members to come and speak to me and get more detail on those matters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting of Parliament.